Welcome back to The Extract. I'm Kyle Meyer, and um, I want to talk real quick about uh, this place called Australia. You might have heard of it. <laughs> That's not a knife. That's a knife. Uh, they make wine there, so I've been told. Yeah, make a bit. Make a bit. A bit. <laughs> do, do, do you guys know how big Australia is? I mean, Australia is the size of friggin' America. Right? You know, you basically take America, you, dry, you, yep. you, take, you drop Australia on it. And so when we talk about Australian wine, it, it's like if we were talking about American wine. It was, it, you know, it's like saying, oh, the stuff over in the North Fork of Long Island is the same as Washington, which is the same as Texas and the same as uh, California, which of course, laughably, it isn't. But here in America, we tend to think that way. Yeah, you get a lot of, lot of talk, people talk about Australian wine. They keep saying, do you say American Cabernet? Everyone says, oh, no, no, there's no Aperon Sonoma, and there's this. Well, we're exactly the same. We're the same size country, and these 65 growing regions have all got diverse histories, totally different climates, totally different soil types, and so the whites are all different. And, and Shirar and Chardonnay are the two great examples. If yeah. you, you can move from our area to Margaret River right at the bottom of, of West Australia, that's 3,400 kilometres <laughs> to drive. And they're quite totally different. Totally right? different. different. Totally yeah. different areas. You see what I'm on about? By the way, next to me, Bruce Tyrrell, uh, one of the... Uh, no, you aren't officially an Australian wine legend, aren't you? Wasn't there like a big um, ceremony where you got like yeah, a hat and maybe a plaque and some medals yeah, or something? That's for the Hunter Valley. Yeah, you get a thing yeah. hanging around your neck. You're right. um, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, anyway, legendary producer of some of Australia's greatest wines, both red and white, sir. Yeah. It is a sincere pleasure having you in the room today. And I think it's really fantastic having Bruce here because for once, you know, uh, we really get to focus on regionality in Australian wine. And one region in particular, the Hunter Valley, which quite simply, there's nowhere else almost in the world like yeah. it. You yeah, guys are entirely at, unique. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're all there because we're crazy. Um, <laughs> no, it is. It, it, we're the most northerly of the, the premium regions. We're about 100 miles north of Sydney, mm -hmm. about 20 miles in from the coast, so we get cool down at night in summer. But because we're more northerly, we get our ripening in the in the middle, middle to late summer. Mm -hmm. So we're, my sister and brother-in-law have got a winery, 900 kilometers south of us and they start picking eight weeks after we do so yeah that's the the difference and I suppose it's the same here from Washington to Santa Barbara mm. there's probably a big difference in times but what it means for us is that we get our flavor ripeness early mm -hmm. so in general if you look at Hunter Valley you're one and two points of alcohol less than most of the other regions um, we do Semillon better than anyone else in the world. Hmm. And it works for us because at 11% alcohol, they're flavor ripe. Right. And they've got really strong acid and, and, and really low pHs, so that gives them the ability to live. The knock on the hunter was like, it was this place, it was close to Sydney, it was kind of like the default spot to put grapes, right? When the Busby collection first came over and all these things were getting cultivated and it was happening and Sydney was a burgeoning city and you needed a wine culture to go with it. And it was just like, well, how about over here? Well, it was, was, it, was it that simple or was we, it? Well, it was a bit simpler than that. Um, in the early 1820s, the major form of alcohol for the colony, which we were still then, was rum. Rum, yeah. So you got the governor there, and you've got the military and a few of the major landholders over here. They control the rum. Yeah. And rum's currency, basically. Yeah. So our area was set up and promoted by the government to get an alternative source of alcohol for the colony. So you could actually be competitive. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you, you imagine if you had a politician with foresight like this today. Mm. 1830. The New South Wales government sends this Scots agriculture teacher, James Busby, back to Europe. No. And he's away two years. He leaves with eight, oh, just over 800 different varieties and clones of varieties. About half of that survives the trip. Mm. Now, benefit for us is he brings them back in bundles of 20 and bundles of five. The bundles of 20 cuttings go to the government. The bundles of five come about 15 miles away from us to his father's property. Mm. And they started a business of propagating from those and selling them. 
They are two of his nephews married two of my great aunts. So I think we've probably had a fairly good crack at what worked. <laughs> Although one of them, Arthur Kilman, died young. Yeah. And my grandmother always said that he died early because it was the only way he could get away from great aunt Flo. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and so people often say to us, you know, what are you trying that's new? He's saying, well, there's not a lot of point in it because they've all been tried to a large extent. Um, and, and we're growing today the things that survive. You know, the areas, we've got 10 years to go, we're 200 yeah. years old. So, so is that what happened? You know, like, like Busby brought this stuff over, mm -hmm. right? The hunter kind of had first crack at it. The sticks went in the ground and Semyon, uh, just by natural selection over a process of a century, yeah. Semyon made it, right? Yeah. Like, you yeah. know, it wasn't Senso, it wasn't, which by the way, Busby, he wasn't dumb when he got these cuttings. I mean, he sourced cuttings from what were at the time and what still are probably the, pre the best preeminent area. best areas for those grapes on the planet. Mm. Okay, Syrah came from Hermitage, you know, the, everything, everything came from its right place, right? There's a wonderful quote in his trip diary, which I have a copy of. And it says, I arrived in Ta the small town of Tain mm -hmm. on the Rhone River this morning. I met Monsieur Richard. He had no wine to sell to show me as all that year's crop had been shipped to Bordeaux to bolster the clarets. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez, I laugh when I read Easy money, right? <laughs> yeah, easy money. Easy yeah, money. No but shit. he did Spain, Portugal, round the south of France, up mm -hmm. the Rhone, up into Burgundy, and then a little bit in Italy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then the balance of the collection came from the University of Montpellier, mm -hmm. uh, where our greatest ever winemaker vineyard on study, a fellow called Moro Sachet. Mm -hmm. Um, and then the rest from the Botanic Gardens in Paris. That was the source of it. So the Semillon came from where? No one knows. No one, okay. Yeah. So, because um, we know where a lot of Busby stuff came on, but the Semillon, we don't have an idea. It, Busby wasn't the only source. It was this big collection, but there were bits mm -hmm. and pieces. The first fleet stopped in Cape Town mm -hmm. and got cuttings. Mm -hmm. okay. And that happened every time there was a, a major shipment, of, mostly in those days, it was a major shipment of convicts, of people. <laughs> um, they stopped and they got grape cuttings. Uh, I've got a letter at home, my great-grandfather writing to his mother in London to get cuttings from Kew Gardens and send them out. So there was, it came from vast... John MacArthur, who was the head of our sheep, father of our, our sheep industry, wool industry, uh, he got sent back to... London by the government because they wanted to get rid of him because he was causing too much trouble. He came, Boney Goat came back, yeah. he bought quite a large collection of cuttings with him. Mm. So it's a diverse thing. You would assume that the source for, um, for South Africa would have been Bordeaux, mm -hmm. to be an assumption. Mm -hmm. And so, but after a hundred odd years, the clone would have mutated and changed a bit, I would yeah. think, from where it started. So. Um, it, when it first came out, they used to call it green semon, green grape, mm -hmm. and that's probably because you could pick it earlier, and and that suited our area because we can get wet and humid at, at vintage time, and you can pick it early, you see, you get away from the rot. Very little chardonnay grown anywhere mm. because of that reason. Yeah, chardonnay's not that easy to grow if you haven't got the appropriate spray, right. um, and so no one the growers wouldn't touch it because they'd lose their crop too often. Right. So you have, and you guys have some severely old semillon. You might, in fact, have some, if not the oldest semillon vineyards in the world at this juncture. Just about. Yeah, I think it's owned by Drayton's. Have got the oldest in the district. It's 1899. Mm -hmm. The Drayton's bull paddock. Uh, but we've in the area now got 11 blocks on their own roots over 100 years old. Mm -hmm. I've now got. I bought the seventh of them just before Christmas. Congratulations. I'm, I'm trying really hard to get the other four. <laughs> <laughs> So what makes Hunter Valley Semillon so unique? Because it really, this is one of those wines, guys, just first thing, in a blind tasting, like you line up 12 bottles of wine, right? Some Burgundy, some this, some of that, some of that, some of that. Anybody who's, who's a good professional in the business, has some experience, can go, Hunter Sam. Yeah. What makes this wine so distinctive? I think it is, is, is when they're young, they're really bright and fresh and vibrant, sort of lanolin, sunlight soap sort of characters. And then they go at about five years, Suddenly they go through a development stage. Palate fills out, gets softer, 
get more of that toasty honey character. They do that again at about 10 or 11 years. Mm -hmm. And then of course, now under screw cap, they can live for 30, 40 years without any trouble. So they're probably, if you look at Riesling from Clare in South Australia, and you forget the base flavour, mm -hmm. the wines are actually almost identical, structurally and ability to live and all of that stuff. And, and actually they're the same, Clare's the same latitude as Sydney which the South Australians don't like admitting. But, um, <laughs> but it is, so, and it's in similar dry you know, sort of conditions, hotter summers. So yeah, it's sort of, you really can't compare this to anything. No, it's its own gig, yeah. It's its, its own thing, that's the, that's the great thing. I think it's, and it's what's driven us, um, you know, the last more than half of my life has been spent working on this variety and getting the right vineyards, getting it. My chief winemaker's been with me nearly 40 years. So his spins worked on techniques and equipment and whatever, and I've gone out and found the best vineyard. But the winemaking's pretty basic, huh? I mean, you guys oh. are you guys are kind of you know, like in the nicest way, kind of as old school as it gets, right? Super traditional in the wine. Yeah. For, well, for Semillon, it's it's pick it. We if we've got a sort, we do it in the vineyard because our problem is getting out bunch rot. Mm -hmm. And if you leave it in the bin, take it to the winery, put it on a sorting table, the juice is infected already. Yeah. So we clean it then, pressed. Um, into stainless steel, fermented about 15 degrees, neutral yeast, cleaned up after ferment, stabilised, filtered into bottles. That's about it. That's it. We have this saying, Spin and I, that if you get a young winemaker comes in and wants to fiddle with a semolon, the best thing to do is immediately take them round behind the winery and shoot them. <laughs> <laughs> if he doesn't die? Well, I'm confident he will, sir. What do you think, Jack? <laughs> Why don't you just kill him, sir? <laughs> no. no. You, you, we were talking earlier about the range of soil types, and, 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 and it's very important to get this point across, right? Because, you know, we, we in America, we're so intense on grouping Australia into this one kind of Australian wine. Mm. And it is not that. I mean, this is, this is the antithesis of this. This is single Sweating. vineyard, single soil work with minimal manipulation in the cellar to produce a, a characterful wine that, that comes from a place, which sounds a bit like the whole philosophical aspect of what makes France, so French. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I don't think we're very French, but but it's things like, and, and one of the great things today is is having drones. Yeah. So you can, I had a, a block of vineyard, headland, and then another block that then gradually went up a hill. And I was picking the first two rows, well, this one over here, mm -hmm. because the soil was safe. And, and it was much better, right? But clone of drone over it, I'm now picking the first seven rows. Because when you get the photograph, you can actually see, see the it. colour on the ground of where the soil changes. So, you know, they don't be about another ten grand a year. So, made the drone right. <laughs> <laughs> paid for itself. <laughs> yeah, it's great to have that. But it is. It's about. But you can also go ten metres yeah. from the best bit of soil you've ever grown grapes in to the worst. Mm -hmm. And it does our area. The soil changes rapidly and, and, and from good to bad. Mm. So if you come in, you know, you go to a place like Bordeaux, it's wall-to-wall -wall grapes. Yeah, right. yeah. Napa Valley floor, wall-to-wall -wall grapes. Home, there's vineyard there and there's vineyard there and then there's a bit of scrub and then there's another bit of vineyard because of those good bits of soil. We don't have many left. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and, to, and to the point, what, what, what you have to understand at home is it's not like the Australian wine industry started uh, 20 years ago. Yeah. I mean, you guys have 150 years under your belt to figure out 60 to figure out where those soils are, to figure out where the grapes can grow. Exactly. You put the work in. Mm. Since you guys are essentially more old world than the old world at this juncture, <laughs> to a certain extent, right? <clears throat> do, you, do you ever get phone calls from other parts of the uh, of the world coming to you and saying, "Hey, can we? Is there is there a way to access your material, or how does that work?" Uh, that... We're pretty jealous of it, right? Well, that's, that's the point. But, but I'm um, saying you got to get door knocks, right? Like, your semillon's more semillon than our semillon. There's a chunk of semillon and chardonnay in South Africa. Yeah, that 
I gave a black eye met there in the early 80s. Mm. Um, I met him at a conference in 77 and a whole heap of South Africans came through and he was a nurseryman and he said, any chance I can go and cut a few nodes? I went, yeah, come on, Stevie. So he smuggled those back into South Africa. All right, so one lucky bastard. Yeah, and apparently it's done very well. Yeah. Um, but no, we're, we're a bit, and we're very careful because of the, the no phylloxera. Right. Biosecurity is, is incredibly important to us. And, um, um, because you know, we've got these priceless assets that, in a, to a large extent, you know, I own the oldest Chardonnay producing Chardonnay vineyard in the world. In the world, yeah. That's a priceless asset that mm. the world industry can't afford to lose. Right, right. Mm. No pressure. No, no. No right. pressure. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, get out of the vineyard. Right. Bruce, thank you for coming today, sir. Thank uh, you. Honor and privilege to talk to you. And thanks for uh, filling us in on your story. And thanks for letting those folks know kind of really what time it is. And uh, hope to have you in here uh, again soon. Okay. Thank right. you. Cheers. Thank you. All right.